next Sunday, Lord willing, I will be here. But I want you to know that next Sunday, I've asked um, Andrew Barnes if he would bring uh, a message to us as a church, if he would speak. Now, you know it's very unusual for me to to say ahead of time kind of who's preaching and who's not preaching. Andrew is the newest member of our church staff. He is um, uh, working as our next-gen pastor. And uh, I want you to hear him. I want you to, us to, together to be able to uh, hear what God's put in his heart. And so I tell you in advance so you can pray for him this week. Um, I checked in with him yesterday about, again, about, hey, we're good to go for next Sunday. And he said something that I don't think I have ever said in my life. He said, um, this was this weekend, talking about next weekend, he said, I finished the message today. (laughs) Help me, Jesus. (laughs) So um, pray for him and pray as over these days ahead as that just sits in his heart and come here next Sunday, prayed up, ready to hear from the Word of God through his messenger, Andrew Barnes. And I look forward to being in this room with you to be a part of that. Now, January 1st, uh, we have one service here at 11. So um, you normally are coming um, to give you a little time to celebrate New Year's Eve and a victory by the Bulldogs. And then at 11... On January 1st, we'll be in this room worshiping together, kids and all, and it'll be a grand time. Uh, And then January 8th, I want to mention to you uh, that uh, Sunday night. Now, January 8th, just to have it in your mind, again, would be one day before Georgia plays for the national championship. (laughs) uh, But on the night of January 8th, At 6 p.m., I'm talking to you, all right? I want you to be in this room at 6 p.m. Changes schedules a little bit. It's not a routine for us to all gather like this on a Sunday night. We'll have Sunday morning services, but it's on Sunday night, the 8th at 6 p.m. We're going to have a time of prayer And Vance Pittman will be here to preach on that Sunday night, uh, challenging us in the area of prayer. Vance has preached here before. He's a 20-plus year pastor at Hope Church in Las Vegas. He's recently left pastoring that church to become vice president of the North American Mission Board. He's leading the church planting efforts of the Southern Baptist Convention across the United States and Canada. And he will be with us here that Sunday evening. And so, um, spiritually, we all need to be here to hear this message and to kick off this time of prayer. Uh, Fleshly, I want you to be here so it's not just me, all right? Uh, So, let's let's fill the room and let's uh, encourage Vance by being present. And let's hear from the Lord on that night of January 8th at 6 p.m. That will start for us 21 days of prayer. We'll call that 21 days of life-giving prayer. A college student came to me last week and said, Pastor, with just like kind of high school, we're going to do 21 days of prayer again next year? He said, I came every morning at that 6 o'clock time. And I said, yes, we are. And he said, it changed my life. And, um, and so beginning then on that Monday the night, 21 days of prayer. You'll hear more about that. I just want you to know that's coming. Let me mention a couple of other things that are really important. And they come so fast after the first of the year. I want you to be able to plan for these. One is January 22nd. January 22nd is a ladies' ministry night here on church property. I want to ask the ladies, if you would please mark that on your calendar. Know something big and special is coming for you on that evening. And then the first weekend of February, 
men for all of us, an overnight retreat at the Y Camp in North Georgia, February 3rd and 4th. We try to do this every couple of years, and uh, we'll be back at the Y Camp. And uh, men, let's get registered for that, signed up for that, and go um, shoot some guns and eat some meat and open God's Word and pray and see what the Lord has for us on that weekend. And then I'll mention one other thing to you. The last weekend in February, it's a new event for our youth ministry. We're calling Wadi Weekend. So parents and teenagers, you'll hear more about it, but save that last weekend of February for a huge, hugely important time in the life of our teenagers, Wadi Weekend, the last weekend of February. So just a little family time here to get some things in front of you that are important as we head toward the beginning of a new year and wrap up this year. And I want to ask you now to open your Bibles to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. And this continues to be in, in some way a part of what we need to hear as a church family and all be on the same page with. If you have any history here at Watkinsville First Baptist, you'll know that um, December is a little bit predictable in that we're going to be celebrating the birth of Christ and we're also going to be challenging one another to take this good news of Jesus Christ to the world. We do that through a, a call to go in the year ahead. We do that through a call to prayer for the nations. And we do that through our giving, through what we call the Acts 1-8 offering. The Acts 1-8 offering is received by our church family December, January, and February. I look at those three months and I pray and I ask the Lord, what can our, what can our family give? What can I personally, what can the Sibley household do? And, Lord, what would be obedient to you? Just by revelation, would you show us what we need to give as a church family this year for taking the gospel of Jesus Christ to the world? And oftentimes, as I give to the Acts 1-8 offering, it would show up in my records as being something that I give in December, something that I give in January, something that I give in February. It just works better for us uh, that way. But by the end of February, I've given to that Acts 1-8 offering. Last year, our church family gave the largest offering in the history of our church to missions, giving uh, just over $249,000 to this Acts 1-8 offering over those months. We had a goal last year of $225,000, and we went past that in a beautiful, beautiful way. This year, um, we have a different kind of goal. It's not one big lump sum of 225000 or 250000 It's a different kind of goal. Our world has lots of problems. There's one problem in our world that is the greatest problem. The greatest problem that our world has is lostness. It is the absence of a personal relationship with Jesus Christ in life after life after life. Perhaps you've heard in recent days that our world's population now exceeds 8 billion people. It's hard to hear this, but statisticians tell us that 157,690 people die daily lost without Jesus Christ. We believe that heaven is real and that hell is real. And the way that we are able to spend eternity in heaven with Jesus Christ and avoid being separated forever from Christ in hell is through a personal saving relationship through Jesus Christ. And God has given most of us in this room um, the, 
the privilege of knowing him. He's given all of us the privilege of knowing him. The most in this room have received him. And so now having received him, we live with this opportunity to get this good news to those who do not know him. And I'm standing before you today, much like a, sal a Salvation Army kettle bell ringer. And I'm ringing the bell. The 3,500 career missionaries that are living internationally are not coming home to us this year to ask us to give. They're relying on pastors and leaders in churches across 45,000 plus Southern Baptist churches to ring the bell. Thirty-five hundred endorsed chaplains to the North American Mission Board, and the some twenty-five hundred missionaries in the U.S. and Canada through the North American Mission Board are not coming home today to stand before us to say, "Help me live on the field." They're relying on pastors and churches to ring the bell. Many, many years ago, a woman by the name of Lottie Moon wrote home to believers in the U.S. challenging them to give so that the gospel could reach the world. For 39 years, Lottie Moon, as a single woman, labored in China to take the gospel of Jesus Christ to that world. From time to time, you'll hear us talk about the Lottie Moon Christmas offering that Lottie Moon Christmas offering for us is rolled into the Acts 1-8 offering and we give 50% of the Acts 1-8 offering to the Lottie Moon Christmas offering for international missions. And every dollar of that goes to provide the salaries of those who are living internationally having been sent by Southern Baptist churches through the International Mission Board. Lottie Moon labored there for 39 years. Some of you may know this or may not be aware that there was a season where Lottie Moon actually lived in Farmington just down the road for us. And she had a back porch um, apartment where she spent, I believe, the summer there with a family. And uh, that house is still standing where she spent those days. There's even a local connection to her. And as big as, um, as big of impact as she continues to have for our, our global reach, you may be surprised to know that as big as she seems, that Lottie Moon stood four feet, three inches tall. A mighty, mighty big impact. big, big heart. Our goal this year is this. $157 per person. I want to ask you as an individual over these next three months, is there a way that you could at least as a baseline start by giving $157? Why? Because if every one of us would put our treasure out in this way, perhaps it would brand in our heart a remembrance of 157,690 people dying daily without Jesus Christ. And you may give much more than that. You may give multiples of 157. But let it be registered deep in our heart of the desperate need for our world to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. The last words from Jesus, our resurrected Savior before he ascended to heaven, 
is in the book of Acts. I hope you would look there with me for just a moment. It's our memory verse for this week as a church, Acts 1-8. Jesus had gathered with his disciples. There were 11 of them at this time, Judas having already ended his life by this time. And it says in verse 6, so when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power. Verse one, Acts 1 verse 8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This, this Jesus who is taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. So these last words of Jesus, to go and be witnesses, is where we get our um, emphasis on this Acts 1-8 offering. In this Acts 1-8 verse, we have the message. It's the, it's the story of Jesus Christ. They want to know times and dates, and Jesus says there's something else for you to be focused on, and that's being my witnesses. Witnesses of who? Witnesses of Christ. When we possess Jesus Christ in our life, we become witnesses. We become walking testimonies of what he's done, how he saved us, how he's atoned for our sin on the cross, and how he lives today as a resurrected Savior. And that is the message that we have to take to the world. It is a, not a new message. It's the good message. It's the good news. And we take that message to the world that we're sinners. We're separated by God through our sin. Jesus died and took the iniquity of us all. Upon his shoulders, he was buried. He rose again, guaranteeing that he was who he claimed to be. And it's this message that saves us. Today, when James stood in that baptistry, he was not being saved by baptism. He was testifying to his salvation. When he stood in that water, it was a picture of his life without Jesus Christ. When he was lowered into that water, it's a picture of our old life being buried. And when he rose up out of that water, it's a picture of new life, of our sins being washed away. And even when he walked out of that water, it was a picture of walking in newness of life with Jesus as Lord and Savior. Isn't it a beautiful picture of what Jesus does for us when we believe by faith in him? Maybe some of you need to do that this morning. Maybe the reason for being here this very hour is for you to hear this good news and you hear there's a Savior, there's a forgiver of your sins and you could trust Him right now. You could just call out to Him from your heart and say, Save me, Jesus. I need you. I want to follow you all the days of my life. That's the message that we have. We also have this mandate. It says, You will be my witnesses. That's our work. That's our goal. I, I, Jesus said it in a very kind way, but there was a sense here when they ask about times and dates where it almost feels like Jesus saying, that's none of your business. Times and dates, that's not your business. In fact, I want you to mind your business. And when by you minding your business is you being witnesses of me. And God will take care of the dates and times. God knows when Jesus is coming back. But until Jesus comes back, our business is to be obedient to this mandate of getting this good news to this world. Now, we have the message, we have the mandate, and hallelujah, we have the means. He says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. I love that he doesn't say, uh, you will eventually know enough. Uh, you will eventually be smart enough. You eventually will be 
rich enough. You eventually will be, what, he, he says, here's how you'll be witnesses. You will receive power. And it's a reminder to us that getting the good news of Jesus Christ is different than getting any other information to the world. It's a spiritual war. It's a spiritual battle. And in the heavenlies, forces are raging and scheming against the good news of Jesus Christ getting to the world. And we need power to get this word to the world. We need his strength. We need the power, supernatural power of the Holy Spirit. And we've seen it over and over and over again. Robbie, you, you sit here to my left, and I know you've seen it. We talk about Nepal and how hundreds of people here in Watkinsville could be praying for people in Nepal. People we don't even know their name except for the Bing people. We find a way to get there. We find a way to get to a village. God matches us up with somebody that can translate. You walk into a village, a man standing there. The news is presented of Jesus Christ and that individual prays and accepts Jesus as Lord and Savior. And the missionary says, this doesn't normally happen. Somebody's praying somewhere for y'all. What, what are we talking about? We're talking about the power of the Holy Spirit through God's people working to save souls. And when we go out into Watkinsville, we go out into the world by God's grace, through faith, the Holy Spirit lives in us, giving us a power that is greater than he that is in the world. We have the means. Today, would you ask the Holy Spirit to be on the throne of your life, to fill you and control you, and give you boldness and courage to share the good news of Jesus with people around you. We also have the people. Look around you. Those in the front, look behind you. Those in the top, look out in front of you. Another room of people will gather here at 11. There were 11 gathered here with Jesus on this day. There'll be close to 2,000 here today. That's just in our church. 45,000 Southern Baptist churches, that's just Southern Baptist. Think of all the other denominations and all the other non-denominational churches that know the good news of Jesus Christ. Listen, there are people that God will use to go and churches that God would use to send. Maybe God's calling some of you to go. And I want to exhort you to go for some length of time next year. The multiple places that we will be Next year, Robbie, our missions pastor, it will help facilitate us getting to those places. It's an email away for you to be able to spend a week, two weeks, three months, a year, two years, career, to get that process started of going to the world and taking the good news of Jesus Christ. All of us should pray about being willing to go and put our blank check on the table and say, Lord, wherever you, go, wherever you lead, I will go. Why? Because you're Lord. Because you're Lord. But not all will go. And those that stay here, I want to exhort you to a fresh commitment to be a sending church. To send with your prayers and to send with your encouragement, to send with your letters, to send with your gifts, to send with your enthusiasm, to send with a burden for lost souls. We have possessions. And one of the hindrances for us reaching the world may be how we handle our possessions. God has put in our possession resources that it takes to get people to the world it takes right at sixty thousand dollars a year for an international missionary to live on average in another place of the world and it's through our giving that makes it possible so we have the message we have the mandate we have the means and we have the map he says be my witnesses in jerusalem certainly in their mind they thought Right here, right in my backyard, right in my front door. 
among the people that we live and work with. In all Judea, that spreads out a little bit further, regional. In Samaria, that raised in their mind people that are different than us, different that are not like us, even people that we may have prejudice against. And then he says, and to the end of the earth. And this map that Jesus shows is that he puts in our responsibility, in our scope, the whole world, the nations, to take the gospel. And so that's our challenge as a church, to be picking up the torch that began here in Acts chapter 1, to take the message of Jesus Christ to our world, to the ends of the world, through the power of the Holy Spirit as his people, using the resources that he's given to us. Now, our Acts 1-8 offering, half of it goes to International Mission Board. A fourth of it goes to mission, missionaries that are serving in North America and Canada. And then a fourth of it goes to uh, hands-on projects. Many of you say, yes, I'll go. I'm not sure how I'll afford it. When we all give together, some of those resources help people be able to go so that the cost is not so much. A few days ago, I received a letter, some of you may have received it as well, from Bill Hager. Bill and Jan Hager have served for a number of years, sent out from our church family. They work with crew in the city of Boston. Uh, Bill has worked for more than four decades through the ministry of crew. And in recent years, for more than two decades, he's worked trying to reach faculty and graduate students with the gospel of Jesus Christ on university campuses. He's been doing that in the Northeast, there in Boston, now for several years. A real focus on Harvard and MIT. And he wrote this letter, and I want you to hear. Just close your Bibles, look this way, and we're about to be done. I believe you'll hear in this letter why it's so strategic for us to be in Boston doing work, why it's so critical for us to be sharing the gospel in our community and on campuses close to us, and why we need to get the gospel to the world. Dear Carlos and Carla, I was having dinner at the Harvard Faculty Club a few weeks ago with 100 plus professors, PhD students, and campus ministers to discuss the topic of immortality. Most of the attendees were not Christians. Asked by the organizer of the event to lead the discussion at my table, my first question was, on a scale of one to 10, how important is the topic of immortality to you? Rachel, a fourth-year Harvard Ph.D. student in evolutionary biology, was the first to respond, quote, If you mean my personal immortality, I'm not all that interested. So a two or a three. But if you mean the survival of the earth, I think that is of immense importance. So a 10. You hear what she's saying? Far more important for her to save the earth than to be concerned about eternal life. Henry, Rachel's domestic partner and also a fourth-year Harvard grad student, chimed in. I agree. As a matter of fact, it could be argued that people over 70 years old who are using up Earth's resources should be incinerated and the energy yeah. it could be argued that people over 70 years old who are using up Earth's resources should be incinerated and the energy generated by that used to power the earth. 
By doing so, we could solve two problems at once. Get rid of the old people who are using up resources and provide renewable energy for survival. Unquote. Incredulous, Bill says. Do you really believe that? Maybe, he replied, meaning that he did. Bill said, why 70-year-olds <laughs> being close to 70? Why not 30-year-olds? Why not 30-year-olds? Knowing that he was not far from 30 himself. He nearly choked on his beef wellington. <laughs> Our table had a rip-roaring discussion that night, but afterwards I began to wonder where these two bright graduate students were getting their ideas from. How did the survival of the earth become the highest value and how is it that people are not considered, and how is it that people are now considered resource depleters and expendable? Our astonishment and laughter will turn to tears, won't they? Bill said, it made me realize once again how important it is to reach professors with the gospel and to provide resources for Christian professors to represent a biblical world view on campus. When I read a letter like this, I too, I gasp. I thought of the eight presidents of the United States that were Harvard graduates. I thought of the four current justices on our Supreme Court that are Harvard graduates. And I think about a nation that is abandoning or already has just, it's just lostness. And I share this story to remind you of how real it is for the need of the eternal life-giving Savior to be shared with the world around us. Let's be faithful until he comes. Amen. Father, help us. We love you. In Jesus' name and for his glory, amen.